Jesus told his disciples repeatedly that they would endure persecution for their faith. How they handled that persecution would determine the future of the Christian church. In tonight's lesson, we're going to begin looking at the fourth chapter of the book of Acts to see the first arrest of two of the apostles, Peter and John, and how they handled that persecution. We need to look at their example. So open your Bibles to Acts 4 and let's dig in. study in the book of Acts. I'm glad you're here. Before we begin our session tonight, I want to talk to you briefly about something that happened in our state of Virginia on Tuesday. Two days ago, Governor Ralph Northam announced that he's making Juneteenth Day a paid state holiday. Tomorrow, Friday, is Juneteenth Day. The Emancipation Proclamation was issued by Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863. But for various reasons, among them a desire by owners to keep their slaves, news of their emancipation did not reach the slaves of Texas until at least 30 months had passed after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. Two and a half years. The announcement of their freedom reached Texas on June 19, 1865. Of the 50 states, 46 have named June 19 as Freedom Day, an official state holiday. But get this, up until the past few weeks, I had never heard of Juneteenth, and no one in my family had ever heard of it either, and no one had ever observed it. What? Here is one thing we did right as a nation and we failed to observe it and celebrate it. If we're going to make progress over racial issues in America, we cannot sit on the sidelines and let things continue as they have. And celebrating with our black neighbors and friends the day of emancipation, while only a start, is a good place to start. It's easy for me to understand why June 19th is to black people what July 4th is to all Americans. What a day to celebrate. I don't intend to make this time of Bible teaching a political forum by any means. <clears throat> what I am saying today comes out of my Christian faith, not my political affiliation. We as Christians have been given the ministry of reconciliation. So in a nation so divided as it is, let's get to work reconciling one another. Let's pray. Our Father, our nation needs to repent. And we as Christians need to repent over our slowness to understand the mental anguish that our black brothers and sisters feel as they look at their history in our country from the earliest days right up to today. There was a great cry. We need to hear their cry and cry along with them. And we need to do all that we can to heal the divide by healing the wounds that have festered and have become chronic through the centuries. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, Father, if we are going to say that we walk in the Spirit of Christ, then we want your love to flow through us so that we might exhibit the kingdom of God through our spirit of reconciliation. We must not walk behind. We must walk ahead, leading the way, setting the standard for the rest of the nation. That's what Christians do. So, Lord, we pray that you'll help us take the lead. Now, tonight, our Father, we ask you to help us study your word and remember the things we learn so that they become a part of us. 
May we be faithful to our calling as disciples of Jesus and as his church. Amen. In our last session, we pointed out that tensions between the Christians, especially the apostles and the Jewish officials, grew gradually as the apostles continued to proclaim their message. Do you think that the apostles were surprised by this opposition that began to come against them? I don't think they were. Jesus had told them repeatedly that persecution would be a natural result when the kingdom of God came in opposition to the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of darkness. In fact, in his most central teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to them, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now because Jesus spoke about persecution in this central document of the Christian faith, it seems that persecution is not only a part of the apostolic way of the first century, but of every generation in every century. And indeed there are parts of the world where persecution even martyrdom is a regular way of life for believers. In the first half of this fourth chapter of the book of Acts, we have the story of the first arrest of the apostles. In this case, Peter and John. The outcome is good, but it does raise a red flag of warning to the apostles. The arrest of the two stems from two events covered in chapter 3. First, there was a miraculous healing of a paralytic near the temple. According to this passage, the paralytic was more than 40 years old, so there was no doubt that his healing was a miracle. In fact, the officials readily admitted that this was a miracle. And then second, in response to the confusion about the source of this miracle, Peter stood up to once again explain the source of the miracle and to proclaim the gospel of Christ. That was the second event that raised the suspicions of the temple authorities. Now Luke tells us in verse 4 that the number of people who believed was around 5,000. We're not sure if the total, 5,000, was a cumulative total or if it was 5,000 people who believed that day in response to his message. My guess is that it was a cu cumulative total. That is, it included the 3,000 that had believed after Peter had preached his first message, and about 2,000 more on this particular day. Now, I take that view because the number of people in Jerusalem at this time was substantially less than there was on the day of Pentecost. Peter had an audience of very likely tens of thousands on the day of Pentecost. It is certain that he had substantially less on this particular day. Now many might wonder how he had 2,000 converts with such a small audience. But that's not hard to figure out considering the nature of the miracle that the people had seen. So it is easy to see how the message that Peter and John and the other apostles were proclaiming was grabbing the attention of a lot of Israelites with an alarming rate of conversions taking place. And this rapidly growing community of followers of Jesus was alarming to the leaders. Now I think it's important that we see the pattern here, the pattern of evangelism that led to the rapid growth of the church. The pattern is very simple, and it works very well. Miracle followed by preaching. The miracle drew the crowd, and it increased the faith of the listeners. The miracle affirmed the presence of God in the lives of the speakers. So when the speakers presented their messages, the people were ready to believe. You will see this pattern followed in many parts of the world today. And the results are no different than they were for the apostles and the other early believers in the New Testament. So the persistently large crowds who were listening to the apostles and their accompanying miracles 
raised concerns among the Jewish leaders, and the time finally came to take action. So they arrested Peter and John. Now the list of those who came to arrest Peter and John included the chief priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. Let's look at them. The Sadducees were essentially in control of all the temple operations. If they were here today, we might call them the liberals of the Jewish faith. All the high priests belonged to the party of the Sadducees. Because the existence of the Jews as a, as a nation depended on good relationships with the Romans, the Sadducees collaborated as much as possible with the Roman authorities. They opposed the religious or the nationalist aspirations which might bring the Romans to take action against them. The high priests were all part of the same family and from them came the ruling high priest, the one who was in charge of the highest Jewish governing body, the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin consisted of 71 men plus the high priest. While there were Pharisees among them, the majority was the Sadducees. The Pharisees were represented by the scribes, the legal experts, whose main interest was the study of the law of Moses. All proceedings were based on Mosaic law. The Sanhedrin was empowered to pass any sentence on a criminal except the death penalty. I think they were allowed to pass the death penalty for blasphemy, but not for anything else. And then came the captain of the temple. We might say that he was the chief of police of the temple squad, whose responsibility was to main the, maintain the peace around the temple. Now, arresting Peter and John was not just a matter of walking up to them and saying, come with us. By this time, several thousand people had gathered to listen to Peter's message. And you probably wouldn't find a more friendly audience toward Peter and John than this audience that had been witness, witnesses of the healing of this paralytic. But somehow these officials coaxed Peter and John to follow them all the way into the temple offices without instigating the crowd. But make, make no mistake about it, Peter and John were under arrest. And because it was late in the afternoon, they were put in the local jail until the next morning. Now, what do you do when you're sitting in jail because you are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? You may wonder, how can I be in jail when God just healed the paralytic through me and I was proclaiming his gospel to a friendly crowd? We try to think in terms of justice, and when injustice prevails, it disturbs us, especially if we are the victims of the injustice. That is how most of us think as Americans. But I'm not convinced that is how Peter and John were thinking as they sat in that prison cell overnight. Jesus had prepared them well. And the one thing I know they would never do was to be silenced in their proclamation of the gospel. This morning I read from Matthew's gospel these words from Jesus. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I suspect that Peter and John spent that night in jail praying and asking for guidance as to how to best let their light continue to shine in the circumstances in which they found themselves. To redeem the situation, to use it for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. I'm sure they asked for boldness to proclaim the gospel in the same way toward a hostile audience as they had been proclaiming it before a friendly audience. And finally, I believe they slept well. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, was abiding with them that night. The next morning, the entire Sanhedrin assembled, 
Remember that in those days, they didn't have voicemail or text messaging to speed up the communication process. But somehow everyone was notified and called to this early morning meeting. Annas, the senior ex-high priest, was there along with his son-in-law, Caiaphas, the reigning high priest. He would preside over the Sanhedrin. <coughs> Once everyone was assembled, Peter and John were brought into the chamber for their hearing. And the hearing began with a question. By what power or by what name do you, did you do this? Now there's a tone of indignation in this question, as if they were saying, by what power or by what name do people like you do things like this? After all, they were Galileans, and Galileans had no power or respect from them. Now, as I've mentioned, Jesus had already prepared the apostles for occasions like this. He said to them, essentially, Settle, therefore, in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. So here we see Jesus' promise being fulfilled. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, we cannot be sure if Luke was telling us that Peter had a fresh experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit, or if he is simply reminding us that Peter acted as a spirit-filled believer. In either case, the point is that these apostles behaved so magnificently and so effectively because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the key to the success of their ministry. It is the key to the success of ours as well. If we fail to remember that, the consequences are quite severe. So, without any preparation on his part at all, Peter addressed the ruling council, listening to the Holy Spirit as he spoke. Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done, by, done to someone who was sick, and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was, re was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. Wow. Peter packs a mouthful in that one sentence, doesn't he? Notice that he points out the healing of the par that the that the healing of the paralytic was a good deed done to someone who was sick, and today he stands before you in good health. Now, by the way, this, the paralytic was standing there as their chief defense witness. How do you punish someone for doing a good deed? In fact, a miraculously good deed. In fact, how do you put someone on trial for doing such a good deed? This is the part of the stories that always puzzled me. A man is sick, paralyzed, or blind, or has a withered hand, or some other debilitating malady. Suddenly, that paralytic walks, with the, bl walks the blind sees, and the man with the withered hand is healed. Who would not celebrate the healing of these individuals? But there is no celebration among these leaders. How can that be? That's why Jesus said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? It boggles the mind to see how callous these leaders were when one of their own was healed. Peter went on. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now remember that not many weeks had passed since the ruling body had been responsible for the arrest and condemnation of Jesus. These people in that room that day had sentenced Jesus to death and had turned him over to the Roman authorities for execution. 
Many of them had watched his, his crucifixion. They had hoped that they had gotten rid of him. But their hope was short-lived. He was back. In ways that they could never have imagined, he was back. Now there's one individual member of the Sanhedrin that I want to mention at this point. I'm sure his name is familiar to all of you. His name was Nicodemus. Do you remember him? He is the Pharisee who came to Jesus one night. His story is recorded in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Nicodemus showed respect for Jesus and listened wisely to his teaching. He admired Jesus. He knew that Jesus was a teacher who had come from God because the miracles that Jesus performed proved it. No one can do the things that he did unless God is with him, Nicodemus said. Now, whether or not Nicodemus believed that Jesus was the Son of God or the Messiah might be debatable at this point in his life. But Nicodemus was also one of the people who attended Jesus at his burial. He assisted those who buried Jesus' body. So I would like to have seen the expression on his face when, on this particular day, Peter declared openly that the miracle of the healing of the paralytic had been done in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I suspect that the whole body of the Sanhedrin erupted in comments and arguments as a result of what Peter had said, but not Nicodemus. I can see him silent. I can see his eyes opening wide and his jaw dropping. He remembered his conversation with Jesus. He remembered Jesus' peculiar behavior at his arrest and trial. He remembered all of the stories of Jesus' teachings and the signs and wonders that had been reported that he had done. And he remembered Jesus' death. Nobody ever died as Jesus died. Nicodemus may have been shocked at what Peter had said, yet there was something about Peter's statement that proved to be true. It was almost as if he would say, I expected this. And while Nicodemus was a member of the bo that body, there was something in him that hoped that what Peter had said was true. You remember that when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Because no one can do the things you do unless God is with him. We know. Who are the we? They are some of, the, of his fellow Pharisees, I'm sure. And now Nicodemus knew that he and his fellow Pharisees were right in their estimation of Jesus. He was a rabbi who was sent from God and more. So when the uproar in the chamber that day died down, Peter went on to finish his statement. That all the nation know that this man stands before you in, in good health in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Now I said earlier that the Sadducees were the liberals of their day. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. In fact, they didn't believe in the Old Testament except for the first five books. One of the reasons they had Peter and John arrested was because Peter and John were preaching the resurrection of the dead. And they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. If they needed evidence of such false doctrine, well, they, here they had it. But not only do they have the evidence that Peter and John were preaching the resurrection of the dead, they also had evidence that Peter and John were preaching, that what Peter and John was preaching was true. The evidence being that God himself had raised Jesus from the dead. True or false? Of course it was true. What other explanation could there be for the miraculous healing of this paralytic? Why would Peter and John make, a, make up a story about Jesus' resurrection if they themselves had been the source of the power of this miracle? 
I'm sure the people would gladly have rewarded them handsomely for their good deed of healing. They would have been set up for life. But Peter and John refused to take the credit for this miracle. They insisted that, that it was by the name of Jesus that this miracle had been performed because that was the truth. Peter and John were standing in their own defense. But when Peter made the statement, whom you crucified, he had suddenly put his audience on the defense. Essentially, he was asking them to defend themselves for murdering the one in whose name the good deed had been done, as was the case of all the other things that Jesus had done. Peter went on to say, in essence, that their treatment of Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy by quoting from Psalm 118, verse 22. You may be familiar with that verse. The stone that was rejected by you, the builders, it has become the cornerstone. Now Jesus himself had made reference to this passage in a parable that he told on the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. The story is told of a man who had a vineyard and he left his servants in charge of the vineyard. But whenever he sent his representatives, that is the prophets, to check on the vineyard, they beat the representatives and killed them. Finally, the owner of the vineyard said, I will send my son to them. Surely they will respect him. So he sent his son and they treated him worse, with great contempt. They beat him and murdered him. Then Jesus quoted this verse, the stone which the builders rejected. Jesus has now become the cornerstone. What does that mean? It means that all authority in heaven and earth <clears throat> has been given to him. It means that he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven and supervises the kingdom of God. So these people standing condemned before God for having rejected and murdered their own Messiah, they stand condemned. But as we said on previous occasions, Peter was not called to proclaim the bad news primarily. He was called to proclaim the good news. Sometimes you have to proclaim the bad news first before you can proclaim the good news. So Peter ends his message with the good news. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. This is one of the most famous verses in the Bible, and it should be memorized. In our next lesson, we're going to take that verse apart and analyze it. Before we move on to the conclusion of this hearing, I hope you'll be with us. God bless you. Jesus himself had made reference to this passage in a parable he told in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. He told the story of a man who had a vineyard and he left his servants in charge of the vineyard. But whenever he sent his representatives, that is the prophets, to check on the vineyard, they beat the representatives. Finally, the owner of the vineyard said, I will send my son to them. Surely they will respect him. So he sent his son, and they treated him worse than they treated the other representatives. They beat him and murdered him. Then Jesus quoted this verse, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now what does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus is the cornerstone? Well, that requires a lesson in and of itself. But let me say that it means that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. It means that he is Lord of his kingdom and that he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven and supervises that kingdom, the kingdom of God. So these people who rejected their own Messiah and condemned him to death now stand condemned before God. In essence, Peter has turned the tables on his listeners. They wanted to condemn him and John, 
but he has brought the message of condemnation to them. Now, as we have said on previous occasions, Peter was not called to proclaim the bad news, at least not primarily. He was called to proclaim the good news. Yes, sometimes you have to proclaim the bad news before you can proclaim the good news, and that is what Peter did here. And so he ends his message with the good news. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. Peter is saying here that salvation is possible, but there is only one through whom that salvation comes, and that one is Jesus. This verse is one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible, and it should be memorized. In our next lesson, we're going to take that verse apart a bit and analyze it carefully before we move on to the conclusion of this hearing. One of the questions we need to ask is what Peter meant when he used the word salvation. If you think that he meant only going to heaven, I have good news for you. He meant much more than that. We'll take that up next week, okay? I hope you'll be with us. God bless you.